All this month I've been talking about the road, that we are all on a road. Many of you may know I'm a, a little bit of a Star Wars fan. I've always liked Star Wars. I remember when the first three trilogies came out, or the trilogies, the first three came out, and for some reason they went to the end and not the beginning, but anyway, in that series, there was one of the episodes where Luke, the young Jedi, was with his master teacher, Yoda. And in that scene, uh, Luke was trying to use the force to raise a big jet out of the murky water. And he basically said, I can't. I'm trying. I've tried. I can't. And then in Yoda's famous words, and I'm not going to do my best Yoda in imitation this morning, he said basically these words, try not or do not. Do. There is no try. Now, now think about what Yoda told young Skywalker. Try not, or we would say, don't just try. See, a lot of us in our life, we try to do things. We try to serve God. We try to please God. We, we try to do whatever is before us, and then when we fail, we give up. We quit. And the lesson that Yoda wanted to teach young Skywalker was not just trying. It wasn't just doing. He basically said, you either do it or don't. There is no try. And, and that's where so many of us are. We, we try to do things, and then when it gets tough and the road is hard, we just give up. We quit. Later in the trilogy, when Luke, now a better trained Jedi, meets his father, Darth Vader, and Palpatine, the evil emperor, and here's the big showdown. And Luke is being pressured to joining the dark side, and he refuses. And this is what uh, Palpatine said to him. It is unavoidable. It is your destiny. Now, fulfill your destiny. In other words, he was saying your destiny, from his perspective, was to come over to the dark side and the evil of the world. And Luke refused. And it was later that Darth Vader saved his son, and he killed Palpatine, and you know the whole thing came to a glorious conclusion. But if you follow Star Wars or did it. So, with all of that said, this is what I want you to think with me about this morning. We all have a destiny. We all have a purpose. We all have something that God created us to do and to be. And, and I want you to think of it not in one way, but maybe two ways. The first way is this. We all have a purpose that God created us for. And that purpose is unique to you. And when I'm using this word destiny, I'm using this as your God-given purpose. God wants us all to be followers of Jesus. He wants us to grow in our faith. He wants us to love Him. He wants us to serve Him. That is all... All of us fall in that boat. And for some of us, there's that more specific purpose, that God wants us to do something specific. And that may be a better parent. It may be a mom or a dad, or it may be a, 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 what you do for a living. It may be what you do here in this church. It, it, I mean, that list is just as endless as you and me. There's just so many possibilities because that is your purpose, your destiny. Now, with all of that said, as we've looked at this idea of the road, the road is this. So if you've kind of missed this connection, here's I'm going to try to make it real plain. We're all on a road, and we choose the road that we go on. And the road that we should be on is the road that will lead us to find, discover, and then fulfill the purpose that God wants us to fulfill. That's the road we should be on. And sometimes we get on the road and we are doing a great job, but then we get off the road. We take a detour or we take 285 and we just go round and round and round and we never get off it. Sometimes that's what we do, but God wants us to stay on the road that will lead us to our purpose of becoming the person that he wants us to become. And when we stay on that road, 
it's not always easy. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's challenging because the road God wants us to be on to become that person means we have to take up our own cross and follow Jesus. And that means it's not always easy. It comes with pain. It comes with tribulation. It comes with trials. It comes with triumphs. It comes with victories. But God uses all of that stuff, the negative stuff, to build within us character and to strengthen us. And so, as we've looked at last week and the week before Jesus' road to his own cross, and we've learned that going on the road to our own cross is a lonely journey. It's my journey. It's your journey. It was his journey. He struggled with it. We struggle with our own road. And then we meet that moment where we think, oh my goodness, this didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. And yet God says, listen, I am with you and I will be with you and I will give you exactly what you need. So just learn to be calm in my hand. So here's where we come in, we're coming to today. You're here. Now, Sunday, the Sunday after Easter is, is kind of like, I've never been drunk, but I've known some people who have been drunk. The Sunday after Easter is kind of like a drunk person's hangover. Did that make any sense? Because on Easter Sunday, there's a lot of people, and I mean, we brought out extra seats last week, and then, then, you know, today it's like, like the normal crowd. And you came back. And I'm not saying anything about those who, who aren't here today. What I'm saying is you come, most of you, every week. And, and you listen to my sermons and you sing with Angie and the choir, the music. You listen to the prayers. You participate in the service. And so you, you come... But this is the question I want you to think about this morning as we think about the road, specifically the road that you are on. Do you leave each Sunday just like you came? Think about that. Do you come as you were and as you are and you go through all that we go through and then you, do you leave the way you came? unchanged or maybe partially changed a little changed maybe a little moved but not changed see that's the real question because when we're on the road that Jesus wants us on we have to change we can't stay as we are I mean that even me I mean I, I'm constantly changing and I'm constantly trying to grow in my own faith walk. And sometimes it's just not easy. Because guess what? I come just like you come with a lot of stuff to church every Sunday. We all got stuff. We've, we've all got baggage. We've all got things in our past that we wish weren't there. And then God calls and stirs us and we think, eh, I don't know about all that. Do you leave changed? Now, with that said, in John chapter 21, in this chapter, this is the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples. The third time. Now, in this story, it's kind of, I'm not reading the whole story, I'm just going to read a part of the story. But in the story, Peter and James and John and some of the others they have now moved from where they were in Jerusalem back home to Galilee. Peter, James, John, they were all from the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee. And Peter one morning says, I'm going fishing. Now, don't, don't think he was going luxury fish. This was what he did for a living. He was a professional fisherman. So he's basically saying, well... This is what's happened so far. We've walked with Jesus for three years all over Israel. We have seen a lot. We've experienced a lot. We ourselves have seen a lot and experienced a lot and done a lot. We watched him crucified. We know he was buried. We've seen him alive. We've seen the miracle. He's appeared. He's disappeared, but he's not here now. I don't know what else to do. I'm going to go fishing. 
Anybody want to come with me? And the group that he was with said, yeah, we'll come. let's all go fishing. So they got on the boats, boats, and they went out about 100 yards from the shore there on the Sea of Galilee. <clears throat> they fished at night. You know what they caught? Nothing. <clears throat> Not a single fish did they catch. Well, the, this, the sun was breaking. They saw someone on the shore. It was Jesus. They didn't know it was Jesus. Again, they're pretty far offshore. Jesus has already built a fire out of charcoal. He's already got some fish on it. He didn't need to go fishing. He could just make the fish right there. Boom, let me fish. Boom, there they are. So there's the fish on the, on the coals. They're cooking. And then he called out to them, Hey, have you guys got any fish? Nope, been fishing all night. Haven't caught anything. Why don't you throw your net on the other side and you'll, you'll catch some. And they're like, ah, well, what have we got to lose? They did. They caught so many fish. Then Peter said, or John, I believe, it's the Lord. They knew that wasn't the first time they had heard him say that. Peter being Peter jumped in the water, swam to where Jesus was. The others are rowing, trying to... He left them with that fish, okay? Or all those fish. And so... Now they're eating breakfast. You know, we may think it's odd to eat fish for breakfast, but they eat fish in Israel a lot, by the way. If you ever go to Israel, you will have fish for breakfast. And, I mean, you don't have to eat it, but you can eat it. Y'all, you don't eat fish? Bless your heart. And and, in a nice way, Becky, I'm I'm sorry, that came out totally wrong. Uh, Gee, see, God's still working on me. Then Jesus, though, in the story, pulls Peter aside, and they start to walk away from the others. John, though, follows. And then Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And, of course, Peter said, yes, you know I do. He asked him another time, yes, you know I do. And each time Jesus said to him, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Now, this is where I want us to take up the story. Verse number 17. Jesus speaking, he asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I assure you, when you were young, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to signify by what kind of death he would glorify God. After saying this, Jesus told him, follow me. So Peter turned around and saw the disciple Jesus loved following them. That disciple was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and asked, Lord, Who is the one that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? If I want him to remain until I come, Jesus answered, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. Now, many of you have read this story, and you're familiar with the story. Here's what I want you to see from the story for just a few minutes. In this story, Jesus asked Peter, Three times, do you love me? Peter, if you recall, denied knowing Jesus three times on the night before his crucifixion. Jesus even told Peter before that happened, Peter, you will deny knowing me three times before this night is over. And Peter said, no, I will not. You ever been like that? You ever said, I will never do that, or I will never, and you fill in your own little blank, only to find yourself doing the you will never do it kind of thing. That's why nowadays I try never, stop. (laughs) I try to avoid at all costs to not say what I won't do or will do because we often struggle with those kinds of things. You see, Peter, Peter had some wounds there, and these were very fresh wounds. 
Because on the night that he betrayed Jesus, he remembered Jesus saying, you will deny me. And he remembered him saying, I will not. I will die for you. And he did exactly what Jesus said. And now Jesus has just opened that wound up. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Really, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, you do. And he said, Jesus, you know everything. You know my heart. Yes, Jesus knew the heart of Peter. Jesus knows my heart, and Jesus knows your heart. Now, Peter is being worked on here. Because Peter's on his own road. And Peter, earlier in this day, what did he do? Well, Jesus isn't here. We don't really know what to do. So I'm going to go back to doing what I know career-wise. Let's go fishing. So he's kind of going back to some old habits, some old ways. That's all Peter knew at this point. And so he's fishing. Then Jesus told Peter, Peter, the day is coming. Another prophecy. Not only will you deny me, that happened. Now Jesus is saying the day is coming where somebody other than you will take you, Peter, where you thought you would never go. What Jesus was telling Peter in simple terms was this. Just, Peter, as I was crucified, you will be crucified in your future. And your crucifixion will be to glorify me, your Savior, and your Lord. You see, right now, Peter, you're not willing and ready to go to your own cross. But that day will come when you will be ready. Now, Peter didn't really get that. He really didn't understand it at that point. And that's okay. And then, in the latter part of the story, Peter's... Hearing Jesus, okay, he says, I'm going to go somewhere and be tied, and, uh, okay. Then Peter turns and sees John following them. Then he said, okay, well, that's about me. What about him? And Jesus said, why are you worried about him, him being John? If I want John to stay alive until I come again, that's none of your business. That's my business. So Peter heard another lesson on this morning and it was this, if God is your Savior, you don't have really any say-so in what Jesus wants to do with anybody else. That's between Him and them. And we often compare ourselves to other people, don't we? When we think about this story, you and, and I, that's not right grammar, I'm sorry, we, let me fix it. We all were created by our Savior for a purpose. We all have this in common, to grow in our faith and become more like Christ. That's, that is true of every Christian. What makes us unique is the specific things that God wants you to do or me to do. That's what makes this different and unique. For Peter, his destiny was to become a great evangelist. His purpose was to lead the Jerusalem church and to share the gospel with the Jewish people all over the known world. And eventually, he would give his life willingly and freely on his own cross to glorify Jesus. In fact, tradition says that when that time came, and they were about to drive the spikes in his own hands, Peter said to the crucifi crucifier, Do not crucify me head up. Crucify me head down, because I am not worthy to be crucified in the same way as Jesus. And so Peter, according to tradition, was crucified feet first or feet up, head down. Because he said, I'm not worth." You see, Peter reached the point where he could say, I am willing. And I will glorify my Savior. But there was a lot of growth that had to happen in Peter's life. 
So for you and for me, how can we fulfill our destiny? Now, some of you may already think, I do not want to be crucified. Well, that's probably unlikely because I don't know of any country or place that's crucifying people anymore. But you may be thinking, I don't know what you're talking. See, here's where some of us, we leave like we came because we think so abstract, we can't make this practical. So let me make it a little simpler. Maybe God wants you to do something here. Or maybe God wants you to do something in your family that you're not doing now. Maybe God wants you to stand up for your faith at your school, unlike you have been doing. Maybe God wants you to be a different person at the place you work so that Christ can truly live through you and they can see in you a difference. Maybe it could be any of those things, or maybe something completely different. Here's what I want you to think and do. I want you to ask yourself these three questions. God, what am I holding on to right now that's getting in the way of me becoming the person you want me to become? We're all on the road somewhere. Is there something in your past like Peter? Now, Peter's past was a very recent past. He denied knowing Jesus it happened. Jesus festered and opened the wound. Maybe there's something in your past. Maybe you're saying today, well, look, you don't really know what I've done. You don't know how I've disappointed Christ. You don't know what I was like as a teenager. Or you don't, you fill in your blank. See, it, it just doesn't matter, your past. Your past is your past. Everything you've ever said, ever done, ever thought, God has forgiven it all, every single bit of it, and he's washed it away. Your past is your past. God doesn't live in the past. He lives in the now. He's calling you to a future. We've got to learn to let go of our past if we're going to reach the future God wants us to experience. And not only that, maybe you're holding on to some possessions or some things. You know, I'd, I I mean, I know Rhonda and I for years, we had this vision and this dream that our kids would live near us. And we would keep doing Sunday dinner together. Every Sunday, we'd go to the same church and we'd have Sunday dinner together. And guess what? That ain't happening. And when I say it ain't happening, it's unlikely to happen because even though they now live closer, all right, one lives in our basement. That's real close. But it's only for a short time, and, and they're going to be moving inside the perimeter. And, and so Ron and I have had to come to, to grips with that and ask this question, God, what is it you want us to do as a couple, but also as individuals. In other words, not that we own our kids or own our grandkids, but they're a part of us. So it's kind of like our possession. And so what are you holding on to that you're unwilling to let go of to become the person God wants you to become? Maybe there's a fear. You know, one of the things we fear is failure. We fear that if I try this or I do this, whatever this is, and you, you sense God calling you, if it doesn't work out, if it doesn't end the way you thought it would end, and you let that fear grip you and prevent you from doing it, then you, you've got to learn to let it go. What, what did now, now I know that Yoda is not a Christian dude, okay? Or he's not even a dude. I don't know what Yoda is. He's a little short guy that can dance, or not dance, but jump really high. Into, anyway, so Yoda is Yoda. Luke is Luke. I want, what, what did he say? He said, don't just try. He said, do. And so many of us, we, we look at our life and we say, I can't. I'm not gifted or I'm not qualified or whatever the case may be. Maybe God just wants you to do. Just trust him to, to do, because it's not you that's going to do it, but God using you 
to do it, whatever it is. We let fear keep us from fulfilling the purpose God wants us to become. A, third, a second question is this, is who does God want you to become? Not only is it what are you kind of holding on to, but who is it God wants you to become? See, these were, these were things Peter had to struggle with. Peter knew Jesus is God. He saw him resurrected. He walked with him. He dined with him. He listened to him. But Peter really didn't fully understand who God wanted him to become. And that's where a lot of us are. We're just kind of scratching at the surface. When I say scratching at the surface, we're at the surface for many of us. God wants us to go much deeper than most of us are willing to go. And so when we think about this person God wants us to become, who is it God wants you to truly become? I mean, I'll ask, are you really happy being normal? I still remember the movie. I'd never, I've never seen the whole movie, Young Frankenstein, but I still remember the one scene when they tried to figure out what brain did you give him, and it was Abby Normal. Y'all get that right? Abby Normal, the brain Abby Normal. And he said, no, no, you gave him an abnormal brain. See, so many of us want to be normal. We just want to fit in. But God called us to be a little Abby Normal. For him to be different. So many of us want to just get on the boat and float down the lazy river. God wants us to go to the rapids and swim upstream. But most of us aren't willing to do that because we're, we're content as we are. And that's why we come to church and we sit and we participate and we leave as we came without really being changed. And the third question is this. Like Peter, so many of us compare ourselves to somebody else. Are you comparing yourself to somebody else? I used to do that a lot. I mean a lot. Uh, my youngest daughter, a few, I don't remember how many years ago now, Katie, um, when she graduated high school and went off to college, I was in a point in my life where I was really trying to figure out who I was. This was me, what was that, Rhonda, 20 years ago? Maybe, 15 years ago at least. And Rhonda told me for years, stop it. Stop doing that. She didn't say it quite like that, but she was saying it. And this is what she was referring to. It was me as a preacher. I was imitating for many years of my life people like Charles Stanley. Y'all have heard of Charles Stanley, haven't you? How many of you have heard of Andy Stanley? How many of you have heard of, um, oh gosh, um, well, these are older people now. I mean, I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, oh, can't even remember the names now. I would read their books, listen to their sermons. And then I would borrow and imitate them too much for so many years. And it wasn't until my youngest daughter, Katie, one day she and I were talking because she was going to a church down in Florida where Andy Stanley did it by video. And I learned that she loved it and other younger people loved it. And I thought, I need to be more like Andy Stanley. And she told me, and Rhonda told me, why don't you just be you? Now, here's my thought. I was comparing myself to these preachers, and I thought my way to be me wasn't good enough. Does that make any sense? So if I could be like them, then I would be more successful in the kingdom of God. I bought into it. And then when God took the preaching ministry away from me for a season, guess what happened? I had to learn to stop comparing myself to other people to be me. 
and just do the best I could. Whether that was good enough or not. Now, whether that's good enough or not, it doesn't matter to me anymore. This is what I'm saying to you. You, you can't compare yourself to anybody else. You've got to be you. It took me a long, long time to figure that out. Too long. And I pray it doesn't take you too long to figure out that you can't look at somebody else and try to be like them. Just be the person God created you to be. Be the best teacher you can be. Be the best mom you can be. Be the best dad you can be. Be the best student that you can be. Be the best follower of Jesus that you can be. Use the gifts that God has given you and be the best at it. Just be you and quit looking and wishing you were somebody else. Just be you. And when you, when you learn to just be you, then God can use you as he created you to be. Because so many of us, we won't let God do that because we're always comparing ourselves to somebody else. That even means us as a church. We, we can't be, an, we, we are who we are. We got to be the best us as a church that we can be and not be somebody else. Now, with all of that said, I want to challenge you with this thought as we leave. You came in this morning, post Easter Sunday, with all of the excitement of all the hundred plus people we had last week, excited and thrilled. Now, I don't know what you came expecting. I mean, I really have no idea. But are you going to leave today the way you came? Maybe you will leave saying, yeah, that was pretty good. Maybe you'll leave saying, yeah, it wasn't that good. Maybe you leave and say, you yeah, know, that was all right. I want you to think more about this thought. God, what did you say to me? Me. God, what did you say to me? What do you want me to do about today? God, what is it you've said to me that I need to change? I don't mean a major change. I mean, if you've got a major change, yes, change. But even the major change that Peter encountered on that morning still took years to develop. It didn't happen overnight. Peter heard Jesus, walked with Jesus, and then he had to slowly change. And that's all God really wants of any of us. Change, yes. But even a little change is better than no change. I hope you will think about it, pray about it, and make the changes that God wants you to make so you can become that person God wants you to become. Let's pray together.